the hat heads of Cedro Woolley. When visitors approach the Woodring Flight Academy, one of the first things they will notice is that there are no aircraft parked at the airfield. At least, this was my first observation. I thought, how was I going to become a pilot unless I could practice on a real airplane? Within the flight school building, there were framed glossy pictures of a wide variety of airplanes. As I walked down the hallway leading to the lecture halls, I saw a poster of a 747 soaring beside Mount Rainier on a cloudless day. It was an absolutely stunningly beautiful picture. And there was another poster of a Cessna seaplane landing on a placid Puget Sound. But as far as actual aircraft at the academy, there weren't any. When I asked my instructors about this, they told me this was how modern flight schools operated. For the first 20 weeks, my cohort would be in the classroom where we would learn the basics of flight control systems, navigation, aerodynamic laws, and emergency procedures. And it was only after my police check came back clean would my hands be granted permission to touch the controls of an aircraft. For months, we sat in lecture halls. The instructors spoke to us on how to be the best pilots, bringing forth their passionate wisdom accrued for many years high above in the skies. We watched inspiring videos of pilots flying well, from the Wright brothers in Kitty Hawk to the cosmic commanders of the space shuttle. In the clips, the pilots testified to the joys of flying and reassured us that while it may be difficult for us to become masters of the sky, the life of an aviator is noble and exciting. From the textbook, I learned that flying was a cognitively demanding job, where on a six-hour flight, a pilot had to make 1,500 decisions. That's one choice every 15 seconds. Often these were inconsequential judgments, reversible decisions that didn't result in disaster. Other times, a series of bad choices would cascade into calamity, putting everyone in your aluminum tube, and possibly some on the ground, in jeopardy. I did well on the written tests, adequately explaining how to respond to engine failure or severe weather or if there were unruly passengers. After 20 long weeks of classroom instruction and a clean FBI background check, I was cleared for flight. On my flight day, I met my instructor, Tom Rawlings. He was a tall redhead with a graying goatee. Tom had played center on his college basketball team and looked comically gigantic in the cockpit of the Bombardier twin-engine turboprop. I asked if this was too much of an aircraft for me on my maiden flight. Tom assured me that I had learned everything I needed to know in the classroom. I asked if it would be better if I start on something smaller like a two-seater plane, like a small Cessna. Tom chuckled at what he heard and dismissed it as a ludicrous question. The laws of aerodynamics are universal, whether you're flying five people or 500 people, it doesn't matter. That made some sense, so I trusted him and I strapped myself into the co-pilot's seat. Tom received clearance for takeoff, and in five minutes, he leveled us off at 6,000 feet. Tom said that this was the slowest we could go without stalling out, and I knew this already from the textbook. He instructed me to put my hands on the yoke. Then he asked me if I was ready for handoff. Affirmative. Finally, after so much time and money spent, I was going to become an aviator. The humming turboprop sent out a gentle vibration through the control yoke. When I pushed the flight controls forward, the nose dipped, and the airspeed increased, just like it said it would in the textbook. When I pulled it back, the nose went up and the airspeed decreased. I turned the yoke to the left and felt the airplane shimmy a bit as I directed the airplane to slide across the sky on a bed of air. Tom cautioned me about oversteering. The aircraft would respond in time. I stabilized the bombardier and continued flying, at a slightly altered course to a yet-to-be-determined destination. Tom said that he had looked at my transcript and that I had a great year of training. He patted me on the arm, which I noticed had gotten very tense from all the excitement of flying for the first time. I thanked him, but I didn't lose eye contact with the altitude bubble or the compass heading. My grip on the yoke was getting tighter. I tried to relax, but the continued realization that I was controlling a 400,000-pound flying machine was a bit overwhelming. Tom said that I was going to become a great pilot. Then he unfastened his seat harness, unfolded his lanky body out of the cockpit, and stood on the flight deck of the aircraft. I asked him if he was headed to the toilet, but he ignored my question. You've received top marks in flight school in all areas. Tom opened an overhead storage compartment and pulled out what looked to be a nylon backpack. As he strapped it on, I realized it was a parachute. 
I asked him what was wrong. I took a quick look at all the gauges and I saw no flashing lights or buzzers or gauges redlining. Tom said absolutely nothing was wrong. Tom yanked open the front port door and a screaming wind roared into the aircraft. Tom shouted, Everything is fine, but if you have trouble, try calling ground control. With a three-step lunge, Tom jumped out the door and into the slipstream. That was the last I ever saw of him. Such is life as a student teacher. I wasn't in a cockpit. I was in a classroom. The yoke I was digging my fingers into was the edges of a lectern. And it didn't matter how I held it. My predicament was the same. In front of me were 20 11th graders. I considered the statistic that a teacher made a choice every 15 seconds, and I felt this to be a wild underestimation. I had 15 decisions to make in one second. How was I going to get the attention of the sleepy students, the hyperactive kids, or, well, most of the teenagers who were disinterested in learning American history, especially from a chump student teacher who just came down from the university? I imagine that Tom was sitting comfortably on the ratty staff room sofa, enjoying an extended coffee break and making his rosters for the upcoming basketball game. Mark Johnson's hand went up, and I called on him. Mr. Lohman, who is Dred Scott, and what kind of mother would name her kid Dred? Having tossed me an excellently crafted passive-aggressive question, Mark sat back in his chair, thinking that he had just laid perfect bait for the intern. The class watched, wondering how I would answer this question. I had to make another quick decision. Should I ignore the distraction and answer only the first part of the question? Or should I take his witticism, build upon it, and then send the zinger back as an amazingly clever rebuttal? The Woodring School of Education never prepared me to be funny. They intended me to become a caring, nurturing, and effective educator, not an improv comedian. So I played it straight. Well, Mark, you see, Dred Scott was a slave who traveled with his master to Wisconsin. Being a sensitive, liberal-minded history teacher, I made sure that all the students could see that I put air quotes around master. While he was there, the man that owned him died. Some people thought that he should be a free man because he was in a free territory. But the family of the dead man thought that he should remain property. You see, the case went to the Supreme Court and Dred Scott lost. He remained a slave until he died. I was only speaking to myself. None of the students would remember anything of what I had just said. Mr. Lohman, said Randy Powers, a big bone kid in a Dale Earnhardt jacket and a Mack truck baseball hat. He had raised his hand, but he didn't wait to be called upon. Why don't we have White History Month? I mean, there's Black History Month. Isn't that like kind of racist? His classroom buddies, many of which were wearing baseball hats with truck logos also sewn onto them, nodded in agreement at this apparent racial injustice. Good question, Randy. You see, the other 11 months of the year are white history months. Suddenly, the sleepy students sat up in their chairs as they felt their heritage being taken away from them. I had riled their interests, but the interest wasn't in improving their understanding of what America was like 150 years ago, but rather to confirm and defend their worldviews that their parents sent them to school with. I had been dumped into the shark tank, and it would take me 20 minutes to swim to the safety known as a fourth period bell. A student that I always thought of as Hathead Bobby sat up and declared, There aren't any blacks today that were slaves, so I don't know what this month is all about. Blacks haven't been slaves for like a really long time. How I wished I could have done my unpaid, going deeper into debt internship in some place other than Cedar Woolley, Washington. My internship felt like the Hindenburg, igniting and crashing to the ground. Tom Rawlings wouldn't have been in this position. He would have seen the turbulence forming and corrected course early on. He had the advantage of being a basketball coach that could rap with the kids. He was the type of teacher that could straddle a chair backwards and lay it all out. If I had tried that, I probably would have torn the crotch out of my pants. That's an interesting argument, Randy. I think this video may give you an answer. His question wasn't interesting, but my small compliment bought me enough time to push the videotape into the machine. I had cowardly capitulated, took my hands off the controls, and switched to autopilot. Had I been a better teacher, I could have handled it much better. I would have used the Socratic method to unravel his argument or introduce a guiding question 
that the students could research and develop their own conclusions to. Instead, I had put myself on the wrong side of classroom popular opinion. I had become the focus of their wrath, an easy, inexperienced target, the chump from the university. My educational toolbox was poorly equipped to de-escalate frenzied students. I feared that if I had not engaged the VCR, a question and answer session would begin, the students parodying the opinions of talk radio demagogues. I didn't begrudge the kids for this. Teenagers, despite their unruly long hair and nose piercings, mere community beliefs. I could see what was coming. If the discussion continued, I'd be hearing about black ghetto women who would be driving around in fancy Cadillacs because they had successfully played the welfare system. With relief, I flipped the lights off and the attention shifted from me to the bright screen of the documentary. The documentary began with heartful gospel singers encouraging their flock to keep their eyes on the prize. The Cedar Woolly Hatheads found the beat and mockingly clapped to the rhythm with absurd exaggeration. If they had black shoe polish, they would have liberally applied it to their faces. When the music faded out, they settled down. Several students folded their arms on their desk and cradled their heads in what they hoped would be a late morning nap. I crept to the back of the classroom next to the bookshelf that held no books, only neatly shelled videotapes. Critically acclaimed documentaries sat there such as Ken Burns' landmark Civil War film. There were also offerings that had been pirated off the History Channel. These catered to people that considered themselves history buffs. Unidentified flying objects, lots of stuff on Nazis, and theories on who really killed JFK. Every semester, Tom required them to choose a video to write a report upon. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will see if the student teacher can successfully navigate the pitfalls of Cedar Woolley High School.